Okay, so glad to have you with us, Michelle. Um, but uh, so let's start with the question um, of what you consider to be the square in the field that you're in. What is the scene of action, the place where you can go to meet in the field which you occupy and you're specialized in? Uh, yes, so I, I guess for me it's a bit diff difficult to say in a way because um, my activity is very distributed in, in, in a way, right? So I'm, I'm both very active vir virtually, as, 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 as we can say, I mean, like, you know, through these kind of connections with Google Hangout and Skype and email and, you know, all the social media that we're active in because we do creation and networking online. Uh, but then I also travel a lot. Um, and so my connection, I would say, is in particular with these new spaces. Um, so spaces that are not, you know, public squares in the old sense, but they are places where the collaborative culture is being born, and they are constructive spaces, right? So they're not so much places of resistance, which, I, of course, I support, and are necessary, you know, and, and you know, confronting the state and, and, and social forces on the streets, but the, squ the squares that I'm working in, in French, are called TFU open soups, and I, it's a term I really like, but it's hard to translate. You could say open source third spaces, right? So the first space being uh, the private space, the second one being the public, where everybody is, but then the third one being these like cafes, in life. you know, that's the original of, uh, sense of the word. And so they're the co-working centers, they're the hacker spaces, they are the makers, maker spaces, and some of them are commercial, but many of them are not commercial. They're either cooperative or associative. And in my view, this is where a lot of the new culture is being born, because these people, even if, even as they are not directly political, uh, not necessarily, they may, but they're not necessarily, they are actually confronting you know, day by day remaking the world and they're thinking about food supply chains, energy supply chains, um, you know, how to mutualize their working space, how to, how to be able to support each other, how to create uh, risk mechanisms, you know, risk mitigation mechanisms. Uh, so I find this personally a very important uh, square, if you like, right? And they are connected with each other, maybe not in one, you know, one network, but there are very there were networks of fab labs, a network for maker spaces, and some of these places are huge, you know, like the Omni Commons in Oakland. You know, these are it's a former high school, and it's like there's so many associations and co-ops that are there and working together. Um, so I see this as an important part, which you know might be neglected by the more traditional political. Movements. Um, and do you was there a moment? I mean, we all have, of course, um, seen the the scandalous elements of uh, when this square kind of reaches public consciousness through uh, uh, you know the stories of Assange and Snowden. Um, but are there and and perhaps anonymous? I mean, are there other examples or are there which clear cut cases do you see of rebellion? in the spaces that you're talking about, the kind of new forms of peer-to-peer -peer online and also offline um, cooperation. Yeah well, yeah, well, as I'm trying to say, you know, I'm, I'm less directly involved in, in, in the more confrontational spaces and more in, in space that working on the long term. And mm -hmm. Uh, what I find important is that they are, you know, these people are interconnecting with each other and they're really doing things differently. It's based on cooperation and sharing risks and, and so the way I see things is that we need a convergence between, you know, the people who are, let's say on the front lines, right? Um, but they don't necessarily have the logistics, you know, to speak in like army terms. Right, so what we see with the squares, and you know, you may you may disagree with my analysis, but it's that our you know this new generation is now able to mobilize. There's no doubt about it. You know, through networks, 
and get Occupy and 15M and all these things, you know, with huge numbers of people. Uh, but the the staying power is still quite limited, and in my view, that's because a lot of things, you know, in the logistics side, like the permanent things, the the institutionals, uh, the new new types of institutions that we need are not are not there yet. Uh, and I see these, you know, so, so if you like, if, if you want a, like an analogy, I would say, you know, think about the labor movement. So you had these farmers in the 18th century, they were being chased away from their lands, you know, becoming poor laborers in the, in the new uh, industrial cities. And on one side, they had to fight, right, through the, the parties, the unions, all the struggles they had in the street, but they also had to build longer lasting things like co-ops and unions and uh, mutual funds and things that would outlast any particular mobilization in time. But when there was a when there was a, a an acute conflict, all these things were used to sustain the struggles, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess that's what I think is you know more more temperament temperamentally I'm more inclined to work on that side of the equation, on, on all these, uh, you know, these kind of things that may be not visible in terms of direct struggle, but are very important to to create a new culture and to make it stable, you know, to make it a, a force that can last over time. Very interesting, very very important, uh, I think, um, approach, and uh, in terms of also, uh, you were saying the infrastructure at the moment we see like. Um, that the, the basic infrastructure of democracy is also being really put into question, right? So a lot of people are saying we're living in the 21st century with 19th century democratic institutions. And um, yeah. so, so uh, I think, you know, this has been said also in the context of Podemos and uh, their use of um, online voting systems and liquid democracy. Uh, how, how do you... Do, does your work connect to that in a direct way, or have you experimented with that form? Um, yes and no. So, um, you know, in so in terms of infrastructures, I you know you have these huge things like Facebook and Twitter, which are corporate owned. Um, but in my view, are we we need to be there in terms of communication because you know you have two billion people there, and you know, the kind of alternative infrastructure that compete with them, you know, are usually very, very small and only unite people who already agree with each other. Um, so I think there's a third way, and the third way, again, is, is more invisible, but, you know, when we use Lumio, for example, at the P2P Foundation, and now we are examining something called Weezer, you know, and these are totally open source collaborative platforms with, with new governance uh, models in, embedded in the software, right? Mm -hmm. So, when we connect with groups like Las Indias or, you know, or WeShare or, and we start using their tools, then we are actually building a, a long-term alternative infrastructure which has already embedded these new values. And in that sense, we're not competing with Facebook because they have huge advantages in terms of network effects and capital allocation that we don't have. But if all the alternative groups start using these new tools, Mm. You know, like, technology is not neutral. It actually embeds values, right? And by using them, you actually change your social practice as well. And so slowly you are changing, you know, mentalities because you're using these, these new value-driven tools, you know, value-sensitive design, right? So I think that's, a, that's what we try to do. And in terms of democracy, you know, I think... You know, two things are happening at the same time, right? So the mainstream, the mainstream system is evolving into something really bad, with one more repression, surveillance, uh, you know, repressive laws, destruction of the welfare institutions. All these things are happening in the mainstream. But if you look at the counter reaction, I don't think it's that dark because it, at the same time as this is happening. You know, I believe, and this is why I'm optimistic, that there is such a broad stream of people can actually either resisting or, but also constructing alternatives and changing more and more 
aspects of their life into this new value system. And uh, so I think if you focus on the second, you know, even as you see the mainstream world really disintegrating and becoming you know, really in hospital, inhospitable place for democracy and, and social justice, at the same time, there's a clearly a recreation of, of a you know kind of Gramsci would call this a counter hegemony. Like we are rebuilding, um, you know, oppositional alternative systems at a speed that we have never done before. So I think if you look at that, then you can be optimistic because they're but they're both happening at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the second, because it's networked and it's not in the mass media, it's not not that visible, but it's really happening. And I, I saw a graph just a few weeks ago, you know, the number of citizen initiatives and cooperation and co-ops in the Netherlands, which had a fairly steady growth from the 80s to 2005, became exponential in 2005. Mm -hmm. uh, just straight up, you know, the, so the people are doing things, right? They may not be all political about it, most right. people are pragmatic about it. Like, I want good food. Mm -hmm. You know, I want. I don't want toxic food. I want good food. Or I, you know, I want distributed energy. I want to be autonomous in my energy supply. And mm -hmm. then they create a co-op, right? This doesn't. It's not the same type of people that would be on the squares like with Occupy, but they are also, in my view, working on change. And and I think we need to find these convergences, right? So in my language I use, in French I say we need a, a mode de production qui est libre, durable et solidaire. So the three aspects need to be there at the same time. The open and free input and output, you know, the common side, the, the free culture, free software side, the sustainable side, you know, the circular economy, cradle to cradle design, like re open materials, really looking different, a different way about physical manufacturing. And then the value distribution, you know, is it is it fair? You know, is there a fair social contract? Um, and and we can you, do this, you know, right. without changing society, you know, like a rupture, because that that's really an organic event. You know, revolution is an organic event. We can't predict it, and yes. you can't wait for it. You know, you can be ready can for you, when it happens, right? But it's not something that. So I, can, yeah, sorry. I, I agree with what you're saying completely. I just wanted to ask you if you could summarize again one more, one more time in just so we have that for the camera, that uh, short, you know, you said it in French. If you could say it once in English as well so that we have that for yeah. the clip. Right. So, so we, we need a mode of production and value distribution that is open and free. So based on open contributions and a, and a, and a, a common output that is available for everyone, like in free software, open knowledge, open design. We need sustainable physical manufacturing, right? So using 3D printing not to make toys, uh, but to rethink our production system so that we have circular economy, steady state economy, uh, cradle to cradle design, you know, thinking about making, using less energy and material for our human needs because you know, we can't continue it this way. And then the third aspect is the value distribution. You know, is it fair and solidary? So we need co-op, solidarity economy, social economy, different structures. And it's those three things that need to be, you know, synergized and converge uh, so that when we are on the square, right, where we're effectively confronting power, we actually have something to propose, right? We actually have yeah. working alternatives that are already there. They just need to scale up. Mm -hmm. We have difficulty in scaling them up and in integrating them, but they already exist. I, so, so this relates very much to what I was going to ask you next is about uh, what we call realignment. It's just kind of a, a new form of, of uh, saying engaged, but also engaged across the spectrum in so many different ways and seeing that all these different alignments, all these different orientations that you see people who, are, who want clean food, who want uh, you know, non-carbon-based uh, energy, who want etc. All these different uh, movements and, and single issues are converging in a way, uh, and yes. if you could kind of, is that what you're saying as well? And you think it's very difficult to really to have them realize how much they actually have a common common goal, 
And how yeah. do you think we can make that clearer? What kind of language can we use? How would you de define PTP, for example, for the broadest possible yeah, exactly. audience? That's, that's basically what I'm trying to do, you know, is, and that, of course, is more of a long-term effort, but, um, like, traditional politics is all about public versus private. You know, for 200 years, the industrial politics have been about either nationalizing and socializing and regulating the private sphere versus deregulating, denationalizing, you know, privatizing. Um, and, you know, this kind of pendulum has been going on for 200 years. And what we didn't have um, is this notion of the commons, right? This notion of common goods, of mutualizing knowledge but even also mutualizing infrastructure. Um, so the language that I use, that I'm pushing, is the language of the commons, the language of peer-to-peer, -to, -peer, to show that these things have a commonality. That, uh, for example, instead of producing to make profit, you produce for social usage, right? So you, based on use value, you just produce what you need. Uh, and money is a means to an end. It's not. It's not the end itself, right? Where in capitalism, you know, you don't care what you produce as long as it makes money, basically, right? So to show that there is an underlying set of values, which you know, they're not random. They actually make sense, right? And I think using the language of the commons, for me, is the way to go. You know, and it's, it's a set of, of it's an ontology, it's a vocabulary, it's a value system. And, um, you know, the masses of the people are certainly not moving there as yet, but the pioneering people are, and also in, pol in politics, you know, people who are looking for alternatives, that's the way they are thinking, right? And whether it's the Greens or, or the new left parties like Syriza and Podemos, they're really searching for this kind of new way of formulating the alternative, which is, in my view, based on the commons, the idea of, you know, uh, uh, communities creating shared resources. Okay, one, one more question that before we uh, wrap it up, I'm not sure how much of this we can get in, but it's just so interesting talking. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know how, I mean, uh, Wikipedia is obviously the, the one example everybody will, will know and not feel estranged from when you talk about Linux or something as, as a case of peer-to-peer uh, -peer open uh, platform. Um, what allowed Wikipedia to, to, to do this where, let's say, um, other, you know, forms are, are in the corporate world, so Facebook and so on, uh, Twitter. Uh, why, why, how, how did that happen? And is there a way in which we can kind of create, to use some, you know, jargon, I don't know, the, the, the APIs between these different kind of uh, open source platforms which make it, you know, make the standards open source, which means that anybody can write the, the, the code and connect them, which means open will always win over the corporate closed code. Yeah. So how do we do that? Well, yes, well, well, you know, what I think is happening today is that, uh, you know, the open model is really growing very fast, but it's actually mostly embedded, you know, within the, the traditional economy, you know, basically the capitalist system, right? And um, I think Wikipedia is e easy because, you know, you can, it's something you do, you know, when you come home after work, basically. You can add, add an article or read an article. As you move to software, you're already moving closer to, you know, economic uh, value because software is used in cars, in satellites, you know, in, 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 in your job. And then when you move to open design, you're even closer to, to you know, um, actually producing for human needs, right? So the, so the issue for me is how can we disembed, you know, commons-based peer production from the accumulation of capital, right? So this is for me, so, and, and so you have to really squarely confront the issue of livelihood, right? Because not all the people can volunteer all the time. And the problem with the free software movement and the free culture movement is that they are liberal movements. So th th what I mean is they are, they want rights, the right to share. But then they don't look at the material conditions that are necessary to exercise those rights, right? This is very typical, I think, the weakness of the liberal rights. 
Well, you know, if you're poor and you can't buy a computer, you can't produce free software, right? And they just don't deal with those issues. So I think we need an emancipatory alternative that says, you know, these things are great, but they need to be embedded in new ways to, to generate livelihoods around it, right? So if you're a commoner, today you still need to be either a freelancer in the capitalist economy or you need to be labor for a company. If we create our own co-ops, and I call them open co-ops because they're co-ops that co-produce commons. If we create our own co-ops, our own um, you know, social economy, solidarity economy entities, then we can start closing that loop. So in between the commons accumulation, because we are producing commons, and working for the man, you know, capital accumulation, we build in between uh, cooperative accumulation, right? So I'm a commoner, mm -hmm. and, and the commons is abundant, so it's not a market, uh, it's not a commodity. But, but around it, we create all kinds of services that people need and are willing you know, to pay for eventually, right? And you do this in a cooperative way so that the added value, as it were, stays within the sphere of the commons. And again, these things, these things happen and they exist they don't yet form an ecosystem, an organic ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to build this ecosystem which is able to reproduce itself outside of, of capitalism, you know, like the like the Catalan Integral Cooperative is trying to do in Spain. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, that's, that's exactly the kind of question I was, I was asking. So, for example, somebody has uh, some form of, uh, you know, goods, right? Uh, a house, a uh, a farm or some way of producing um, commodities. How do they? How do they join? So that was the question. Is kind of like how does this the connection? How do you establish the connection without um, simply yes. knowing them personally and you know being in this kind of group of people that works like that? You know, and that's a social question, right? You don't want to just have punks meet punks and hippies meet hippies and businessmen yeah. meet businessmen. You want to have API, so that's the metaphor I was kind of using, that links things that are un unlinked, right? That you just say, okay, yeah. I have this, you have that, and it connects. And how, that, that might be the bottleneck. What I'm proposing is, is institutions. Uh, one is called the Assembly of the Commons, right? Which is all the people who are locally either creating or protecting common goods. That they actually form an organization. Like the Citizen Parliament in Barcelona, something like that. that that as citizens you meet up with other citizens who are moving in the same direction. And then the other thing I call the Chamber of the Commons, which is all these co-ops mm. and solidarity economy entities, you know, they need to link up. They need to look at each other and see you know, what one can provide to the other and make that into a system you know, that can last through time, right? And this is hard work, uh, but it just needs to be done. And you know, once we have that, we would have local institutions that could build social charters and say, you know, this is the kind of politics we want, right? We we want to expand our world, scale it up, and this is the kind of support civic infrastructure we need. And then you become a social and a political force. Um, and you know, I think this can be done in a pluralistic way, right? It's not one one party. It's it's a social movement that supports whoever supports their priorities, you know. And so it's looking about, like, you know, land. How, how do you protect land and housing from speculation? Well, there are solutions. Community land trusts, cooperative housing, there are solutions, and people just don't know them, right? Now, if you have a chamber of the commons, you could, you could be functioning as an incubator mm -hmm. that shows people that it can be done it and makes it more easy because this is the problem if you're young and you want to be autonomous and you need to make a living you know you have a red carpet in front of you showing you how to make a startup hmm. but if you want to stay true to your principles and also make an economy that is compatible you know with your values it's very hard to do because there's no there's no institutions, there's no incubators, there's no facilitators right. that help you in that direction. And we, mm -hmm. unfortunately, you know, this takes time. We need to construct this. Mm -hmm. But it's happening. 
you so know, kind of, and it's like just a P2P CV, a P2P uh, job system, a P2P yeah. uh, kind of network so, that so you gives you see, credit. You know, there are two time scales. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you know, there are two time scales. One is the event time scale, right? Suddenly, everybody rushes to the squares, right? Uh, but this goes up and down. They can fail, you know. And then people go back home and they're disillusioned, right? But then there is the what they say in French, the long durée, the longer term. And this is where you're slowly but surely building the alternative, right? And as the events come and go, you know, then suddenly you're ready, right? Because you have this whole infrastructure that can connect mm -hmm. with the social struggle and give them strength and 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 durability. Okay, thank you very much.